Hello students, welcome back to physical chemistry of the life sciences, the section thermodynamics. Um, I wish you all a healthy, happy and successful new year 2022. Um, rather than having in-person classes like we had in December, uh, unfortunately we now again need to switch to um, um, online classes. So what I do is I'm recording short clips of the, of the different chapters uh, that we go through. Um, and provide them to you via Blackboard. Um, but please also continue to use the accompanying book, The Molecules of Life, and the study manual, in which you, of course, uh, find the uh, exercises for this course so that you can internalize the, the content of the class. So, where are we? We have now covered uh, over three classes. First, the thermodynamics of heat transfer. We spoke about heat capacities and the Boltzmann distribution. We introduced the second law of thermodynamics, um, so-called counting statistics and multiplicity, and we talked about entropy. Today, we'll introduce a new concept called free energy. Free energy is a very important concept in biology because it tells you how um, the molecular machinery of the cell um, is fueled, basically, is powered to carry out all these complex biochemical processes that are necessary um, for us or for any living being to function, basically. Good, so a brief recap of the last class. So in the last class, we learned what a spontaneous process is. And here's an example. When you have a concentrated section of gas molecules or liquid molecules, could also be um, um, of these red type, surrounded by this blue kind of molecules, then over time they will, the red molecules will distribute um, uh, among the, the blue molecules and eventually they will be perfectly mixed, right? That's a spontaneous process. And we've learned that all spontaneous processes are always accompanied by a so-called increase of the entropy um, of the universe. So, and that's exactly what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. It says that for a spontaneous process, the entropy increase of the universe, which is composed of the system and the surroundings, is always larger than zero, right? And there are two ways of how to describe this entropy. The first one is via the thermodynamic equation or the calorimetric approach, because it's based on heat measurements, Q, right? So an increase of the entropy or a change of the entropy is given by a chain by a heat flow either in or out of a system divided by the temperature and to get the overall entropy change you need to integrate over the infinitesimal small heat changes divided by the corresponding temperatures the second way to calculate the entropy is by statistical means the so-called Boltzmann distribution so here um, we calculate the entropy with the Boltzmann constant multiplied with the logarithm of the so-called multiplicity. The multiplicity is simply the number of possible um, um, states um, that a system can have um, um, for a given configuration. So for instance, here, um, when the gas molecules are distributed uh, over the volume, the red ones, then there are uh, many different possible realization molecules, uh, possibilities. The red molecules can be mixed within the blue gas in many different ways, but there are only very few ways of how the red molecules can be very concentrated here in the center. So that means basically this state here has more realization possibilities, a higher multiplicity, a higher entropy and therefore it is a favorable state, right? In nature, um, um, it always strives towards higher multiplicity, meaning higher entropy. So the multiplicity can be calculated with factorials. So here we have a formula for this. Um, the factorial of M, which M can stand for, for instance, um, in our example of the gas molecules distributing between two bulbs, remember, um, M can be the total number of gas. Is, M is the total number of gas molecules. And N is, for instance, the number of gas molecules in one of the two bulbs, in the left bulb, for instance. 
For the example of the receptor and the ligands, we had M being the total number of um, receptors and N was the number of receptors that had a bound ligand, right? And now this equation tells you how high the multiplicity is and um, the higher that W multiplicity is, the more likely this state will actually exist. And there's a problem with this calculation of the factorials, which is that for large numbers of M and N, which normally is the case, there are bajillion gas molecules uh, uh, around us, um, it's, it's not possible to calculate the factorial anymore. And instead, we use the so-called Stirling approximation, which can be used both for N and M to calculate the factorial without the factorial, basically, with a um, approximation, which is valid for high numbers of n or m. And then using these methods, um, we actually calculated the entropy increase uh, for an, the isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. Um, and we arrived at this equation for the entropy increase, both by using the thermal or calorimetric definition of the entropy, as well as the statistical definition of the entropy. Good. So now let's continue um, with the new material. And uh, I'll start with the um, um, first law of thermodynamics, uh, because I would like to show you something that we haven't discussed so far, which will lead us later to the concept of free energy. So you know the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the change of the internal energy comes from the heat flow as well as the work that is performed on the system, performed or that the, on the system, or that the system performs on these surroundings, right? So now what we can do is with this work term, we can express it as volume work as we have done so far. However, there is not only volume work. We have ignored that there can so far we've ignored that there can also be other types of work. So that's why I split the work term now into two parts, one being the volume work, which we are very familiar with already, but the second being the so-called non-volume work. Okay, what is that? Well, um, there are many different examples, um, and I'll show you some examples. Non-volume work can, for instance, be electrical work, right? That is, non, that is not accompanied by a change of a volume, um, but it can also be chemical work, um, which is very crucial for many biological processes. So I'll give you some examples of, of such non-volume work in the following. So the first one comes here. What you see here is a um, vesicle that is being carried over a microtubule by a so-called motor protein, or also known as a kinesine. Right? So the vesicle is being dragged through the liquid in the cell um, via this engine and the engine is basically performing work, right? It's, 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 it's force times distance, basically. That's the work that this engine has to overcome to drag this um, vesicle through the cell. Let's analyze this for a second. So here's a more simplified depiction of this uh, combination of the um, motor protein with the vesicle. What it does, it converts chemical energy into displacement work, simply, right? So the kinesine motor dimer carries a cargo vesicle through the cell, and initially it's at this position, which is given by the dashed line here. But then as it takes a step, it moves the vesicle from the initial to the new position, right? And in order for it to do that, it overcomes a certain displacement, right? But that costs energy because you, if you want to move something against a resistive force, which for instance here is the viscosity of the water that uh, you need to push the water out of the way and the water resists this. It has a certain thickness, the water, a viscosity. Um, that force times the displacement, it gives you the work, right? The work, which is the energy that the kinesine motor dimer needs to provide. So where does this energy come from, right? There must be some kind of fuel that drives the movement. Let's take a closer look at one of the feet of this uh, kinesine motor dimer. And what you see 
is that in these feet there are so-called ATP molecules, adenosine triphosphate. Here's the chemical formula of an ATP molecule. This molecule is like an energy carrier, a chemical energy carrier, or like a fuel um, um, that drives the movement of this kinesine motor protein. How does that work? ATB undergoes hydrolysis reaction with water to form a inorganic phosphate, PI here, and an ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So the inorganic phosphate, the bond that connects it to, the, um, to this molecule, was broken and the chemical energy that was stored in this bond was released to the motor protein to drive its movement for this work to be performed. Right? So we characterize the energy that was provided by the so-called free energy in this example of the ATP hydrolysis, delta G ATP. And that free energy is the maximum amount of work that this process can provide. And in this example, it provides the movement of this foot to the new position against the resistive force. I say that it is the maximum amount of work, the delta G, um, that means the work that is needed for the movement is smaller than um, that work that the or the maximum amount of work or the free energy that is provided by the hydrolysis reaction. And that's important to keep in mind. So this is one example. ATP is the fuel in the cell that, for instance, drives motor proteins. But ATP itself must be synthesized in the cell also. And that's what I would like to show you next. So how is this ATP synthesized? It's also based on chemical energy that is used, that is non-volume work that is used to synthesize ATP. So we know this example. In nature, um, and everything always strives to higher multiplicity. For instance, the, the molecules here, they want to distribute and they don't want to stay concentrated because just of the random collisions that they experience by the solvent molecules that surround them, right? This basically drives this um, increase of the multiplicity and it is something that will always happen. And actually there is energy stored in this process that is used, as I will show you now, to synthesize ATP. So here is an, a schematic of a, a cell which is uh, encaps it is surrounded by a, a cell membrane. Inside of the cell you have a high concentration of uh, protons, um, H3O plus uh, ions. And outside of the cell there is a low um, concentration. So you see there is a concentration gradient between the inside to the outside. However, the protons inside of the cell they cannot easily get out because of the cell membrane which is impermeable to these protons. However, there is actually a way for them to get out, which I will show you in a moment. And when that happens, when they actually start to go out, they exert work the, that is based on the concentration gradient that they, that, that they, that they, um, that they balance out. So the energy from the concentration gradient is used to synthesize ATP. So in the beginning, when there is a high concentration of protons in the cell, there is adenosine diphosphate plus the inorganic phosphate outside of the cell. But this um, um, transport of the protons outside of the cell actually results in the combination of ADP and the phosphate to form ATP. And basically, that's the inverse of the uh, free energy of ATP hydrolysis, which we now call the free energy of ATP synthesis, simply. So how does the cell do that? How does the cell use the energy from the concentration gradient um, to synthesize ATP? Here, you will see it now. This is the machinery in the cell that is used to synthesize ATP. You see, here's the cell membrane 
and inside of that cell membrane you have these um, cell um, these membrane proteins and they basically work like a water wheel like um, they rotate and their rotation is driven by the diffusion of protons from the inside of the cell to the outside. The rotation will then be used to synthesize ATP, as you see next. So, so let's take a closer look at this um, membrane protein that allows the protons inside of the cell in the intermembrane space to go outside of the cell to the matrix. So the high concentration of the protons inside um, gives them that concentration gradient that wants them to go outside because there's low concentration outside. So you can see here at this corner, the protons are entering into the membrane protein and then they actually move behind it in a semicircle to then be released out of this section of the motor protein. And this rotation of these protons actually is driving also the rotation of this, um, of this membrane protein. So here you see now the um, um, part of this membrane protein that's outside of the cell um, above the uh, lipid bilayer membrane. It has different parts, alpha and uh, beta, but that should not be of uh, concern to us for now. What we should take a look at is, you see here at the bottom, the protons that come from the inside of the cell are being released into the surrounding, right? Um, at the same time, you see there are other molecules that are diffusing around this membrane protein. Those molecules are ADP, ATP, and inorganic phosphates. The ADP and the inorganic phosphate, they actually enter into one of the compartments of this membrane protein where they then get synthesized into ATP. Let's take a look where that happens. So the section where the synthesis of ATP happens is now visible here. This part of this protein you see here there's as ATP being synthesized out of an inorganic phosphate and an ADP. We take a closer look now. Here is where the ADP is coming. It's entering. And then from the other side, the inorganic phosphate is coming actually. The movement of this membrane protein, which you see here parts of in the background, is driven by the rotation of this um, membrane protein. And um, the rotation of the, the, the shaft of this membrane protein basically causes a conformational change of the protein, which allows the inorganic phosphate and the ADP to be brought very close together. It basically catalyzes the synthesis of ATP from these two reactants. That's how the um, release of protons from this cell basically is the energy from that is converted into the free energy of ATP synthesis um, to produce this um, ATP, which then will be later, for instance, used to drive the movement of these um, motor proteins that carry vesicles over microtubules, as you've seen before. Quite impressive. So to, to summarize this once briefly in, in, in simple terms, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that um, the internal energy of a system changes based on the amount of heat and the amount of work. And we can split the work term into volume work and non-volume work. The non-volume work is crucial for many processes in biology because that non-volume work, it drives the molecular machinery of, of the cell and keeps us alive, basically. So to prepare this, I have used different sources, different YouTube videos, and uh, a simulation of gas molecules, and of course, the book uh, Molecules of Life. Next lecture, we will talk about more quantitative aspects of the free energy, which, as we've learned in this class, is essential um, for non-volume work um, happening in the cell.